Hello everyone, today we talk about the 1453 Parkery plot in Rome against Pope Nicholas V and talk a bit about the herbs uh, in the pontificate of the latter. We will have to talk about the Parkery family um, in, in Rome, or Porcari actually is the correct pronunciation, uh, as it is one of the most, um, in fact, important aristocratic houses of the city since the, the 11th century the legend goes that the uh, the porcus the, the pig that literally uh, you know camps on the uh, on the coat of arms of the porcari would have been connected to the gens porcia back uh, in roman times i actually have a, a video about marcus porcus Cato completely randomly um coming up soon uh, there wasn't actually such connection at least could never be um, traced. Uh, in any case, this was a, a powerful clan um, playing, as we will see now, among the other uh, remarkable ones in Rome, chiefly, as you know, the Colonna and the Orsini, um, very much the main nobiliar houses of late medieval Rome, about whom we will have to make multiple videos that were popes uh, from these houses, um, as well, and historically and respectively, it would cite the Ghibelline and, and the Guelph party, but they would also swing in different directions so because they were very extensive clans, so certain branches had different political affiliations. The figure of Stefano Porcari, as we, Porcari, as we will see, is the uh, most um, important uh, in, this, in this context, as he would organize, in fact, in 1453, a plot against uh, the, the current pope, after some agitations that had struck the city, I made a video about the Roman turbulence right during the Middle Ages, chiefly for previous centuries, but that would continue at this point. As Machiavelli points out, describing also the Porcari plot, um, the, 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 the point with, with the papal seigniory over Rome is that, of course, the um, the, the city as a wall, prim, the, these various houses, but also the people, um, uh, especially during this humanistic um, times, were seeking for more local autonomies, and that the papal singery would be uh, depending on these movements. The papacy had come back uh, to Rome uh, after the so-called Avignonese uh, captivity that was not a captivity at all, actually. Um, it was the reflection of very uh, sort of independent papal policy, surely intertwined with the French one, but that was connected with broader issues that I discussed in those videos about the decline of universalism, and I'm not going to digress specifically, but it's not until, in fact, the, the early 15th century that after the various schisms that affected the West, the anti-popes, etc., we'll talk about them at some point in, in detail, um, had uh, not uh, yet um, retaken firm control of, of the herbs. Um, the papal states were a quite complicated thing. I made a video about medieval Lazio explaining, especially how, the say, the affirmation of Rome, but also the papal seigniory over it had proceeded during during the Middle Ages. Um, it's a fascinating story because Rome did have a communal um, autonomy and power at some point that the papacy had to contrast recurring to a coalition of other of the other lacial um, uh, towns around Rome that could, uh, of course, the, the, the Pope could not be ousted of Rome. Sometimes it was uh, he was uh, expelled in the single person uh, covering the office, but um, of course the papacy was unavoidably connected with uh, with the holy city um, of Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and there was really nothing, in, even just in the centrality that the herbs maintained throughout all um, say Western Western history, the uh, the, the possibility of uh, the Bishop of Rome not having that, that role, especially at this point, had acquired, made a video about Roman papal power during the 15th century, explaining also internationally the immense 
um, influence that, in spite of the decline of universalism, of both the papacy and the empire in these last centuries, this still maintained also as a as a regional power is forming now. But again, Rome was a big city. Um, we tend to stress how much, especially during the Avignonese captivity, the Arabs had sort of sunk in population, the estimates are 30,000, however, as a minimum. And during the 15th century, Rome, um, in fact, grows uh, further and dramatically thanks to the uh, restoration of the papal presence. The great um, Renaissance capital in the 15th century is Florence, but by the 16th, Rome actually surpasses it. And um, the idea in this, that explains also the, the Porcari plot is in fact not much like getting rid um, of the Pope but essentially getting uh, some extra autonomies liberties of government for the uh, the Roman houses the the commune the the general uh, establishment that run the city also f- say for the Pope and that the Pope also indeed rested on um, showing how dynamic and sort of vital the the Orbs really was um, still under the, the full affirmation of the papal signory, after all. And uh, Stefano Porcari is also an interesting figure in his own regard, right? There's a sort of color di Rienzi in the 15th century. Uh, I made, I think, one, only one video in which I, I described um, Rienzi um, for his... Um, Explained mid 14th century, this th- there are some ideas that basically recur in Stefano Porcari as well. That was, in fact, an admirer of Cola di Rienzi. That is to say, primarily the idea, and here, if, in fact, it's, a, it's the humanism, the Renaissance kicking in, that a republican government on the basis of at least that part of history, you know, that the Roman Republic never existed technically, um, and especially by. by formal official titling um, of course these couldn't look at the empire so the de facto seigneury that was installed from Augustus onwards but uh, there was in the west for reasons we have also discussed here and there speaking of tradition the renaissance etc the of course the importance the arrival of the dignity of men as opposed to the human side that was this, instead the deterior one of, of the fall and so that the approach of um, mankind to to divinity and uh in these regions like an important concept of the essentially the individual liberty of the people italy had maintained even in uh, relatively more feudal states like the papal ones um, a the, the highest per capita wealth in in the literal world um up to this point uh, from from roman times and interruptedly and so where, when you wonder well, so where humanism, renaissance come from as far as this, you know, individual liberty and capacity and education, literacy and, and whatever, um, it, it surely has to do with the, the general mentality that, that the West also broadly meant and maintained a concept of liberty, definitely more pronounced compared to, say, I don't know, the, the Byzantine world, for example, was much more oligarchically sclerotized, right? Um, but, of course, this was still conceived traditionally within a hierarchy, within the uh, traditional, in fact, uh, authorities of universal stature that the, the papacy and the emperor uh, embodied. And here there is a lot of just political opportun- opportunism and, you know, pragmatism, uh, of some sort, there is a chance to uh, ride fundamentally the discontent uh, towards the government as it exists uh, in, in every society to gain some power for, for oneself. The Porcari plot will um, fail pretty pretty violently, showing after all that, especially at this point, um, we highlighted it really in a diachronic perspective in that video about medieval life, so there wasn't much that Rome as a commune could really do. And the Porcari actually were strongly nobiliar uh, elements, right, that had also um, sort of a national renown, right? Stefano Porcari uh, had 
mm, presumably being born in Tuscany, even though belonging to a Roman family, of course, had holdings in other places. He had, however, been captain of the people in Florence. In this very, he was born. Uh, we don't know exactly when he was born. He was like from at, at at the earliest the 90s of the 14th century. Some say of the beginning of the 15th. So being Florence in the early 15th century, meaning meeting with with a lot of great scholars, humanistic figures, having a, a great insight. In fact, also on political theory. You know that. Florence was the cradle of republicanism as opposed to the Milanese so-called tyranny that from the Visconti side actually was seen as a as a positive and neutral term for that matter. And so Porcari thought, because of the connections that we will see he had in Rome, he could sort of play like in, in this pretty turbulent times where the papacy had, say, the, the Pope had problems on his own to run Rome as in this broader medieval uh, you know, in, instability yet that, um, of course, differs very much from our own. And to become even a sort of middleman between papal authority and the people of Rome, something that, in fact, Cola di Renzi had been, um, and uh, playing also that role, of, as you know, of, um, of diplomat, of humanist, of international figure, even. You know, that um, Renzi sort of reinformed culturally the the Luxembourg court of Prague, uh, providing it with all the, say, classicistic humanistic notions I was bringing from Rome as a student of antiquity, um, uh, knowing figures like Petrarch, by the way, we know uh, uh, from Stefano Porcari what his, um, you know, sort of curriculum was, lit in terms of literature and general awareness, in fact, of the say the ancient Latin authors and also the medieval ones, the, the typical, you know, well, typically well educated uh, in laymen from a humanistic context, like in fact in late medieval Italy. He had traveled to France, to Germany. He was, in general, because of his status, like a, a renowned figure. And let's see what essentially his um, exploit and his tragic demise also were about. Right? At some point, um, we'll probably talk about his pr uh, prior um, existence, like to the to the plot, uh, a bit more more in depth. But we have to look also at Nicholas V's pontificate to understand better the context. The cardinals of the 1447 conclave elected him um, even uh, though already at this point um, there was some significant contrast with the Porcari's insubordination there had been I'm not uh, we have some important things to discuss so there is all a prequel to this with other attempts of you know insubordination of well, attempts of open revolt, in fact, but Porcari had been so um, powerful, had already had during the, say, his life important offices as Podesta of different uh, cities of the Papal States, including Bologna, for example, so one of the major ones, that he was necessary to the same Papal authority that Nicholas V's predecessor was Eugene IV that had had basically similar problems to, with, with Porcari already to the ones that Nicholas would have in attempt uh, plots to, to subvert the, the papal government and similar stuff just this would have not brought to the elimination of the papacy or no, nothing like that but just you know just creating making a mess to profit from, from the answering chaos and just Maybe trying to, to weaponize even the uh, say the, the various papal candidates, something like that. Um, and Nicholas thinks that he can actually captivate further uh, Porcari's cooperation, granting him even new honorific titles for which uh, Stefano is uh, appointed by the Pope as governor of the 
Campania et Maritima, that is a province in, in, in the south of Rome within the Papal State. And not the Campania, the, say the Neapolitan Campania. This was meant, Campania is a, is a, simply means countryside. It was this interland part of, in the south of Rome, and Maritima simply meant the coastal area, right, in, in that part. Um, and which is, w- was an important uh, office because uh, again it was very strategic it was at the frontier with the Neapolitan kingdom run at this point by the uh, by the Aragonese um, the um, that was all as you know the essentially the, the conquest of Naples by uh, the Spanish at the Angevin expanses and here we can't sort of uh, increase the the international diplomatic focus but politically speaking lots of interesting things with, with, with the papacy were going on I made a video talking about this regarding Filippo Visconti that allowed eventually the Aragonese to settle uh, in the south because it turned out to be convenient for Milan that was at that point the uh, the one feeling threatened by, by France as it was basically winning the Hundred Years War and Lots of stuff was going uh, was going on in the first place, but here we talk papal government within the papal states most. Um, and Nicholas V was actually deluding himself to some extent regarding Porcari's uh, intentions because Stefano would not uh, recede um, until his death uh, from his purposes, exactly in virtue of this increasing power that he was getting. All right. Nicholas was also pragmatic to some degree. That is, at the moment, let's try to satisfy this guy um, so that at the moment he does not plan some further rebellion. But um, let's also think of how we can contain later on. Uh, but again, chances for this um, uh, insurrections would be if not at the order of the day, definitely frequently in, in, in Rome, that was a quite tumultuous cities on, on, on its own. For example, at some point, there was a, uh, there was a bro, um, uh, broken out in Navona Square among some youth, uh, and Stefano Porcari, with his persuasive eloquence, given that he was an orator, we will see also how he, he, des- he was described as far as his, again, humanistic, uh, classically inspired r- rhetorical art was um, was in doubt, um, to blow on these random embers, right, to um, excite openly the people against the papal governors. We are in 1449. Um, again, the, the complexity of Rome as a city are well worth many other videos um, just it's because of the papal seigniory we do not have so much we have a lot of information but it's point of course about Rome in general also by your Euro, by Western European standards but it's not as much as say you know Florence or other cities that had a more um, Republican orientation because naturally the government was sort of more oppressive and the say that the various estates could not quite be as um, prosper and autonomous as in this case we're seeking to be but in fact these forces were the representation of such ambitions um, at, at the same time um, and uh, Rome was also very different from today like there is not much of medieval Rome left I mean the result again even about this there is actually an a shocking lot of medieval Rome left. Like there are entire countries in the world that do not even uh, count, um, you know, in terms of civilizational output as the the sole remains of medieval Rome today. But um, meaning the city disappears. Like how it actually was, even just visually speaking, was eventually molded by the Renaissance, and uh, which is most of what you see next to the to the ancient ruins, all right? But medieval Rome was also heavily fortified. It's just at, at this point, there are some broader, with, with the affirmation of the papal scenery, some more dirigistic, um, um, urbanistic plans um, to 
say make the city more open monumental etc but we're still for the rest it's still in the heart of the middle ages and so it, it was ex extremely dangerous for the, the popular government to have at this point any kind of revolt violence whatever um, medieval cities tended to be maintaining uh, say yearly f festivals in which they sort of bit the hell out of each other they they they, they, they stabbed one another they, they created some battles that lasted in Rome even un until the 19th century on some bridges the two different sides of the city um, that were a bit the pride of, 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 of the populace right and how tough the men were and you know deterping each other and all the, this kind of stuff and indeed there were lots of interests powerful houses like you can imagine this broader mob acting always in this bossy violent way and, and, and properly the, the Roman barons were historically that rough and sort of um, difficult to tame in the first place so every uh, occasion of violence was potentially to be exploited and the Porcari as a Roman nobleman knew, knew it um, very much uh, himself so after this episode in 1449 um, Stefano with the mm, perception of 300 uh, ducats a year by, by the same Pope is however confined in Bologna in northern Italy across the Apennines the city had become part of the Papal States um, since the the late 13th century um, under the surveillance of Cardinal Bessarion that is an incredibly fascinating figure mm, very famous in, in humanism because he was a Byzantine uh, who essentially fled the, uh, the empire uh, he went on to diplomatic missions like at the Council of Ferrara for example and there had Italian connections and he essentially went over to Italy he converted to Catholicism to be appointed cardinal but right by the same Eugene the fourth I think that Nicholas predecessor if I'm not wrong and that remained an incredibly powerful influential uh, figure connected again with, with the papal government we will see w what role in fact he had to counter the Porcarius plot in fact here the guy we, we mentioned uh, firstly because he was the one to whom Stefano Porcari had to present himself every day to prove uh, that the cardinal that uh, acting on behalf of the Pope that he would not escape from there um, Bessarion is also famous because as a Greek of course he um, was involved in all those works of uh, translation that were going on with, a, um, with increasing uh, arrival of uh, distinguished like elite Byzantine refugees with all their massive libraries uh, precious manuscripts of, of the classical tradition to Italy in the moment of properly the humanistic booming and so the capacity of, of the Italian scholars to translate Greek which was still uh, actually a rare thing overall um, in the West and that contributed in fact to, to the uh, to the Renaissance uh, importantly enough and Bologna again was the you know a good place were to be uh, but uh, pretty far from Rome like from the opposite end of the Papal state and so this was a sort of exile that was imposed by the papacy against this payment that would content uh, the Porcari um, who remained in Bologna for three years um, needless to say he is in contact anyway with all those who were supporting his ideas of um, seduction um, and also that were just in part all those that were disappointed by the, the papal government in the Roman administration powerful people that could mobilize their own retinues uh, etc uh, waiting for a moment of papal weakness to sort of gain something out of it so the sources tell us that Stefano was solicited to come back to Rome by his own nephew, Niccolò Gallo, um, by um, his um, brother in 
Low Battista Sharra and by others that will eventually back his plot, right? The most propitious moment for action seems to arrive in the moment in which the Aragonese troops in Rome that had just uh, come there to, to support the papacy um, go away for reasons now we would not digress on, so that the city would appear mm, undefended, right? As, as a military historian who studied 14th century uh, coups, right, of cities, uh, it's always fascinating to, to see how, not just militarily, but also politically, these coups would, would, would occur, like, in between these moments, of course, of... Um, lower guard, right, and with the with important also technical um, uh, ties in order to seize the, the most important parts of the city, and a city like Rome that, of course, also more complex. Um, the people was in ferment. Uh, again, when you have less deterrent force, the Aragonese soldiers were not particularly tender-hearted people in general, um, and so you know, that there is some more policing, etc. The people, however, all the, the fourth estate has always some good reason to, to make a mess, to, to counter the hierarchy, even though it doesn't even understand why. Um, but these, in, in fact, as in every revolution, are the uh, sort of the, the useful idiots that can make mass and um, manpower um, guided by more intelligent individuals. All right. There are also the exiles, um, other Romans that had been uh, ostracized by the papal government that were quite anxious to come back to the herbs and reaffirming their political position with back uh, the porcari. Um, Wu, with the pretext of an illness, subtracted himself to Bessarion's surveillance. In other words, he said that he was ill, that he could not present himself to the cardinal daily, and um, having cha having camouflaged himself, having changed clothes, uh, he would, as we'll see now, wear normally very uh, luxury clothes, right? And uh, now instead, just like with a, uh, with poor ones and the company of a single servant, while their their retinues would normally be, of course, much uh, lavish, right? Uh, on the night of December the 30th, 1452, or the day before, we do not know exactly, left the same Bologna, um, secretly, of course. Um, this time of the year is also perfect for coups because the night is the longest, and so you have more... Um, useful hours of darkness to carry out coups, right? There is normally a curfew in medieval cities. You you have to do things, you know, but with um, the due caution. In four or five days only, and through mm, secondary roads that the design were not definitely very comfortable and wouldn't it would actually lengthen much the the path, he managed to arrive to Rome, right, he had to, you know, to, to go 100 kilometers a day, which can be done, right, even with a single horse or naturally multiple ones um, from, uh, yeah, Bologna to, to Rome. Um, and uh, he entered the herbs, finally, at the Popol Gate, and he, in, in, that is, of course, in the north, and he hid, of course, in a villa just in the, located in front of the church of St. Mary of, of, of the Popolo. Right? That, of course, you, you know, also in, in modern in contemporary Rome. Um, and here he finally re, um, rejoined with his nephew Niccolò Gallo, that was canon of the same St. Peter to uh, Battista Sharra and to another brother-in-law, Angelo Di Maso. Um, then altogether, this man went to a first 
meeting um, in the same Stefano's house, then they would pass to the houses of uh, the Sharra and of the Maso, where they are reached by Maso's son Clemente and other, uh, again, important names that were part of this plot. Giacomo Magliano, Gregorio Anodevoli, Giacomo Lelli Cecchi, Mariano Castellano, and others. So, if we look at the, the plans that were proposed, um, we can get an idea of in fact, how a coup in Rome could be carried out in the 15th century strategically. So, an option is to take the Capitol Hill, the Capitolium, um, to eventually so that the highest, like, the, this is the, the place where the people normally uh, came, uh, gathered in assembly, right, in the political uh, um, assemblies in, in Rome, right, properly of the, of the citizens uh, at this time as well, so the army used to, right, and so this is also a hilltop, it's fortified, and from there, once sec secured it, so it's a, also a place you can hold out from, you would have to run the city. This was the usual way, right? Shouting, um, long live liberty, and things like that, uh, which was a you know, pretty standard word for the political circumstances, but also a sort of pass one um, in the same way. Another option consisted in having the people rise um, at the aforementioned uh, cry to only eventually attack the Capitol Hill. The choice here is, as you understand, between securing a position or getting the manpower, uh, first one or, or the other. The final option was surprising the Pope and the Cardinals during the solemn pontifical of the Epiphany, that is on January uh, the 6th, um, of course, and so we're talking roughly the same days here, it all happened within a week, right? Thus imprisoning, literally, the, the Pope, the Cardinals, and taking over Rome, having behanded the fact of the, the ecclesiastical government politically. Um, this last hypothesis had to consider this, that I didn't say it before, but Stefano Porcari had actually been mediating between the Pope and the, 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 the people of Rome when the latter had risen against the, uh, the Camerling of, 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 of Eugene the, the Fort, and he had proposed cunningly to actually have the, the, the Camerling re released but giving Castel Sant'Angelo, where he had taken refuge in, to the people that, w that were besieging it, which the Pope promptly refused because it would have been insane just to give that fortress out to the people, and just for, in a circumstance where the Pope had fled to Florence, but he knew, as always, that as Roman affairs went, he would have come back to the city uh, anyway. The people of Rome was, yeah, sort of turbulent, but at the end of the day, um, they couldn't do without the, the papacy in a word or another, right? And, of course, Eugene at that point had been listening to the Porcari because he was a very distinguished individual. He was leading these negotiations, but of course he said, no, we're never going to give that fortress to uh, the most important fortress of Rome to them. Um, and the plot plan went by, as you understand, just by intuitively towards the latter option, right? Kidnapping the, the Pope and the Cardinals. The f former two options are discarded because, um, in fact, the Pope would have taken measure in the meanwhile to mm, secure himself with some sort of defense. He would have fortified himself. Uh, in fact, in the same Castel Sant'Angelo, etc., uh, like in the, in the past times. Um, so it was a very bold um, plan, but also a major one, if you think about the, say the, the political, the international implications of just kidnapping a pope. Um, so in the house of Angelo Di Maso, 
there are, we know, more than 70 young men gathered. The Porcari is confident um, about the uh, adherence to his plan of other 400 men uh, and um, in this circumstance weapons are collected brought um, there to be readily available um, it would have been said uh, later that only a few of these men knew exactly what this revolt would have uh, been for um, the crowd gathered also during a banquet in which um, the Alberti tells that the Porcari arrived to richly clothed, decorated with golden drapes, with necklaces and other ornaments. He bears a flag with the uh, writing Liberty, and on the sleeve of his shirt, he embroidered um, in golden characters the motto Liberator of the City. And on the um, vexillum, on one side, you have Summa Libertas, so the, the greatest liberty, the top liberty, and on the other, Libertatis Institutor, which of course means he who. Institutes, uh, reinstitutes in that sense, uh, liberty, right? The restorer, not quite this, uh, the restaurator, right? But the institutor. Um, from so this tells you the the general um, aside from the rhetorical um, figure here, the, also the power and the sort of the sense of of greatness that this individual boasted with his magnificent look, this um, high sounding uh, claims and just the, the ultimate objective of you know, instaurating a, um, a, a much more at least ideally republican libertarian government compared to the papal one so from the house of Maso, at some point, this force has to cross um, Trastevere. That, as you know, is the basically if you look at the center of Rome from, from the from the other side of the river. Uh, what was, you know, the Etrurian side story within the probably the, the historical heart of Rome. In fact, actually, some of the, the most ancient population of Rome uh, after. The, if you look at after Roman times of how the demic concentration went was was actually um, uh, more continuous in fact in the on the right bank of the river um, but uh, the purpose here of crossing Trastevere is to take in refuge in some uninhabited houses that were located around St Peter um, and at that point the plotters subdivided themselves into four squads. One would remain as a reserve in the uh, square. Other three would move to the assault. Um, it's a good, say, consistent um, plan in terms of simplicity, cohesion, unity of, of command, etc. Uh, the plotters have received the order of getting rid of, even by killing, of anyone who would uh, block their passage. The aim, however, is not, of course, to kill either the Pope or the higher clergy. Right? They're not interested in this. Here we're talking the traditional elite high level. Like they're not. They, they want to use these guys as pawns, not to become some sort of martyrs. Um, you know, uh, at that point, outlaw for, for anybody involved. Because what kind of person? is going to, to kill the Pope. Just just a Byzantine Emperor would do that to, for the record. But the at least they used to do that that time. But um at the same time uh 
of course, whoever is going to stand in the way is going to be taken out. The, I mean, Stefano Porca, uh, Porcari is quite um, cruel in his own regard. He doesn't have any scruple, of course, nor of, of any, uh, at this point, even of religious nature to the extent he will treat um, a pope in, in the same way but of another, say, lay sovereign basically, which in a sense he was, because the Pope had a hell of a temporal um, power, as we were saying, but still there is a difference in terms of universal authority regarding who he is. Um, but this is part of the game, this is part of you know, the, the show of no, uh, no care, right, of, of carelessness towards anything that is going to prevent this ideal liberty of, of the Romans. Um, for this action, Stefano, of course, is hoping of a mass, in, in a mass insurrection from the side of the people. That's the bet, right? These guys that he gathered are not enough to, to overcome even just the papal defenses alone. Um, in a, say, considering the, the general loyalty that does exist, um, the, the troops that are present, etc. But he uh, counts on Stefano counts on to take Castel Sant'Angelo this time and some nearby buildings that would serve to as a further line of defense because he does expect of course some papal counterattack in this quite uh, evolving mess for how the city responds um, but this is the point the entire plot fails immediately because Nicholas V has been informed already of the plotter's intentions, and he had already prepared a line of defense. Right on January the sixth, this is the Epiphany, fourteen fifty-three. Before the same offensive plan can be carried out, the house of Angelo di Maso is surrounded by the papal troops, the dissidents. Def defend themselves, I mean, the, the papal forces try to break in, the defenders try their best uh, to to fight them off, but they are overwhelmed because, again, they, they everything was based on surprise, uh, not superiority numbers or anything. So, uh, the city during these affairs is not even just prepared, like, they, they, they would have being taken by surprise themselves, because this thing was largely secret, or at least those who had to know knew, but they were not the mass, and so the papal troops um, clean everything up. Many of the plotters are taken prisoner. The Porcari takes refuge in a nearby house through um, a certain Francesco Gabadeo. He seeks the help and the, the shelter um, of Cardinal Orsini that was uh, historically hostile to Nicholas V. The Orsini Cardinal, however, man, um, stops in his own palace where he would have had to, to host eventually, um, or where the, at least the Porcari was asking to be hosted, uh, the same Gabadeo, he obliges him to confess the name of the place where the Porcari is hiding currently to eventually reveal this to the Pope. And in fact, Stefano is found in a canteen next to his sister's house. Um, he is tied up, uh, transported to, into Castel Sant'Angelo, that was a, or, a prison, and he allegedly cried, People, will you let your liberator die? Right? And the people is quite eloquent in his silence because nobody does a thing in that. And on January the 7th, um, Stefan is tortured. Um, he renders a wide confession in the process because naturally the papal um, guards were quite persuasive um, and he is hanged 
just two days later on January the 9th, all right? Um, and this is, again, as summary as it gets, according to authoritative sources, uh, Stefano's corpse will swing from the battlements of a, a tower of Castel Sant'Angelo as a memento to, of course, the Romans. Some say that um, Stefano's body uh, was eventually buried in, um, in uh, I think, secretly. I'm not sure eventually, the, but it, it's just a legion because we there is no tomb, like eventually just was to find a, a, a consecrated place. Um, and some think it's in the church of Santa Maria in, Trans, in Transpontina. Uh, some think that he instead was just thrown into the Tiber River, which was also a very convenient way that the Romans, including, you know, eventually nobody cared about the corpse more than much to get rid of, you know, in fact, um, killed people and not to leave trace but he, in this case mostly because of the contempt um, on the same January the 9th also other plotters are hanged among which Angelo Di Maso his son Clemente others manage to flee Rome but they are captured in other Italian localities such as Padua, Venice um, Battista Sciarra will be decapitated in Umbria, in Città di Castello, in the in the Papal States, um, you see others had tried to, to flee in the the Venetian Republic. It was sort of more, you know, uh, more autonomously spirited power in general. It will remain also uh, when looking at Papal politics, bans, etc. Um, some of these other guys fled instead within the Papal States that they had to cross any anyhow to get out of it in the first place. Uh, on January the 12th, uh, Francesco Gabbadeo, that we have seen asking Cardinal Orsini, that didn't like Nicholas but that was loyal to him, were, you know, had been helping Stefano as uh, as a an accompanier, let's say, is hanged um, as well. Nicholas V, after this plot, remained quite... Um, impressed, quite disturbed, right? He became sad, scared. Um, he legitimately feared, of course, that this broader um, uh, event, even though it had successfully um, put down, order had been restored, whatever, betrayed some sort of greater danger in here and in, say, in, a, in his office, in the the, the conflict between the, the papal government and the the Roman establishment in general. And in fact, the Pope does not come out of his residence. He doesn't tour around Rome anymore, if not accompanied by his armed men, also during course, the, the, the processions, all the, the ecclesiastics, the pastoral duties of the Roman bishop. Stefano Porcari's house was destroyed, as a quite common practice uh, in these uh, contexts, like these were uh, important buildings also from a military point of view, they represented as we've seen the might of, of the clans, etc. And um, the Porcari's house will be rebuilt only towards the end of the 15th or the beginning of the 16th century by some members of, uh, in fact, the Porcari's family that would, of course, in a, in a changed situation, but after a long time, as you understand, essentially half a century, a couple of generations, um, that would also provide to the broader restoration economically, um, etc. Um, and in fact, there is this 16th century inscription that is quite telling of the familiar and noble origins of, of, the, of, the, of the family that says in Latin, Ille ego sum nostre sobolis cato portus auctor. Nobile quod nomen os dedit arma toga, which simply means, speaking of the ancient Marcus Porcius Cato Cancer, I am that, um, in fact, uh, Porcius Cato, author of our dynasty, again, wishful thinking, but still, they associated the pig with the 
with in fact that the park was the, the park use as an adjective um, to which uh, f um, noble fame gave the word meaning rhetorical skills as the same Stefano had um, had and think about Marcus Barcus Cato will again make a video soon explaining also his literary works um, and political influence uh, arms of course as in military service these were knightly families right they were trained as men at arms as as gentlemen um, and the toga so the political office as such and uh, the one that evidently the uh, the attempt at Cope of 1453 was aiming at with some Republican and libertarian expectations. Um, so w when you visit Rome, you can see this house, which is not the one of that Porcari had in 1453, but um, that was rebuilt a couple of generations later. And the Porcari went extinguished at some point its goods being inherited by the very powerful Panfili family that is in fact one of the most prominent ones mostly modern Rome we will make videos about modern Rome talking about the various uh, Panfili you know, figures in the history of the herbs um, who because of this Porcari's inheritance would unite the coat of arms of both families that in fact can be found um, on, on the pavement of the left nave of the church of uh, San Lorenzo in Damaso that is in turn incorporated in the Chancery Palace and that that's uh, a vestige like of this um, you know, patrimonial integration um, again still very very high levels in socially right, uh, speaking. Um, so once again in papal history actually a, an insurrection is uh, is successfully as brutally choked right this was inspired to this new humanistic republican uh, ideas but uh, in many ways it was just a ferocious struggle for power this uh, unprejudiced and scrupulous um, Roman Roman houses, right? It's very much like the Italian Renaissance. I mean, um, a situation of um, ideas of um, theoretical uh, thinking of new political models that, however, obey concretely to the needs of the moment, and they are in many ways so groundbreaking even in the way we have adopted them at ex post right considering how eventually the say the, the transition from tradition so, sort of went we say okay well that so it began at the time but in many ways these people believed in much more hardcore traditional principles that here were just toying and instrumentalizing certain toying with instrumentalizing certain particular conceptions that surely were again functional to quite pragma pragmatic purposes I mean a, a Roman nobleman like the Porcari was not really um, a Florentine humanist scholar so that he would deeply understand the republicanism of the ancients but um, at the same time do not underestimate these people's um, personal culture especially in this case because yes knightly family is mostly about warfare mostly committed in this quite iron uh, situation of the peninsula but still educated importantly enough and um, again this is not even like like Rienzi uh, you know some sort of um, slightly lower estate person this is probably the, the, the military aristocracy so it, it's kind of fascinating um, meanwhile the Romans were all a bit shocked by this because they as much as the Pope feared um, this climate let's say they they hadn't um, smelled the 
the, the plot uh, in the air, they realized how vulnerable the, the political stability of the orbs was, and so they um, they were looking at this when yet another disturbing event was appearing on the horizon. As you know, 1453 is not just a random date. Um, France was victoriously concluding the so-called Hundred Years' War, but especially in the East. Constantinople was falling to the Ottoman Turks. Uh, we've seen a minimal connection here with Cardinal Bessari, and you know, was at least part of that broader Byzantine context that was being, um, you know, torn apart by by, by the Turkish uh, invaders. Uh, the papal mm, sort of point of reference, even for these Byzantine refugees, was quite relevant because these men were mostly the again the learned, the aristocracy, some kind. So there was all the problem of the church uh, reunification after the 11th century schism that was a way that we've seen also in other countries like for example the Rusian Palatinate uh, during the Mongol invasion right they essentially converted to to the Roman to Roman Catholicism here it was a bit the same like what what, what do you do after Constantinople has fallen some Byzantines would actually work for for the Turks even to, to to affirm their power instead of a of a, of a Western one, um, they said, you know, better the the Ottoman turban than the papal tiara, etc. So a time of paradoxes, right? A time of prosperity, as we've seen in letters, in the arts, in general, you know, advancement, but still, you know, political crisis, a moment of, you know, of. of um, of danger, of external threats, etc. So that this is very relatable um, to a great extent. Um, and in the same days in which um, the Porcari revolt was choked in blood, the Romans, that again have the sort of rough uh, spirit and you know pretty, in fact, pretty heavy humor. Um, spread quite venom distic that um, would actually give the the input for the the, the consolidation of, of such um, critical habit in which it is stated that in the herbs ever since here I'm trying to say ever since uh, Nicholas is Pope and assassin um, the the, I mean, blood abounds and wine is scarce, right? Which is kind of kind of fascinating. Um, and not even a word is expressed meaningfully enough also for Constantinople, right? Especially like in in Venice, everybody was freaking out because mostly they had a novel interest in in the Eastern Mediterranean, all the trade, all, all the all the traffics that had. The, the, you know, had traditionally remained in in the hands of of the Venetian Republic. Now were threatened by a true regional power, not just the the land uh, uh, lubber Turks that um, you know at best threw some some pirate ship here and there uh, against the much more robustly built Venetian fleets. Here we're talking about a massive regional power that will pro provide itself with the largest Mediterranean fleet. We're talking about this just the other day, about galley warfare. Um, whereas the Papal States is sort of a terrestrial power in the Apennines, like it's not really going to care excessively, except, you know, as the, the capital of Christendom, you're, you're going to be targeted by, by the Ottomans. This is a general threat, right? As the Sultan said, he wanted to water his horses in the... in the... Uh, fountains of, of, of St. Peter. This, this was actually a later anecdote, but still in this broader Renaissance feeling. Naturally, again, that would not happen. Papal States coast were raided, but um, in general, um, again, the, the internal balance of the Italian uh, states at this point is incredibly complicated. We'll have to make numerous videos just to, to set the, the essentials right. Um, 
and it's um, it's otherwise interesting to to look at this um, temper, right? At the at how these events locally. I don't know how many of you knew about the Porcaris plot, but um, it's still like telling you how complicated at a local level things were to manage also the international ones with as it they were being done actually what they were being um in a in a time like this we will also keep talking about the papal states uh, if you're interested for today however i stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.